Hello, my name is Joe Sass. And hi, I'm Phil Stevenson. Um, today I thought I would take this opportunity to ask my uh, colleague Phil Stevenson about Rhinex and about Opus submissions and about the Opus reports themselves. Uh, Rhinex is, a, is an independent text-based format that's common to all brands of receivers and we get reports here in technical support about these uh, these Rhinex files getting refused by Opus, the online positioning user service. And so I wanted to ask Phil why some of these Rhinex files get refused, um, what is contained in the Opus solution, and how we can prevent the, the refusals that we get from Opus, okay? So Phil, let's start with, uh, with why do some of the Rhinex files get refused by Opus? Number one reason is that Opus is picky. What do you mean? Opus requires very clean data. And if it doesn't find clean data in the file, it will reject it. You mean clean data as in don't set up in a forest? Absolutely, don't set up in a forest. If the GPS antenna has shade on it, Opus will probably reject the file. And Opus also only takes static files, doesn't it? That is correct. If, it, if there's any indication that that antenna is in motion, and one of the ways that it might appear to be in motion is if it has a poor solution. So it could be about obstructions or satellite poor satellite geometry or anything that makes that GPS receiver appear to be in motion. Opus will see that as kinematic data and reject it. I've also seen where sometimes the file will have two side IDs. I start the file and it seems to hold on to that old site ID from the previous collection yes and then I give that new that that site ID another name and now Opus thinks I've got two points even though they one data logging session and actually one point ID how do I fix that well the, the best way to fix that is don't make that mistake we can control this in the field the key to success is to know that Opus is picky about that kind of thing GNSS solutions has tools to overcome it but Opus does not so you have to begin field work with the concept of I'm going to submit Opus. What I submit to Opus will be a clean file that does not have multiple site IDs or any other changes that put what you can see in the Rhinex file as markers. Okay. Those markers are just nearly an automatic rejection from Opus. So let's get on past, okay, I've submitted a file to Opus. They've given me a, re, a report, an emailed result that gives me the position. Yeah. There is a lot of information on that report oh, that yes. I think that uh, people, including myself, don't completely understand. Tell us a little bit about it. First off, let me ask you about this uh, this ITRF. It gives me two latitudes and longitudes, two ellipsoid heights. Um, what are those? I, I One says NAD something and the other one says ITRF something. So what okay. is that about? Well, for example, that Opus report that you have uh, it says ITRF 2009.3663 and that ITRF is the International Terrestrial Reference Frame. It's by international agreement and it's basically positioning it relative to a worldwide coordinate system. Uh, the epoch date, that 2009.3663 that was on your report, matches the May 15, 2009 date on okay. The, on that so, report. so that's a decimal year representation. Yeah, yes, it's a way of measuring the year in a decimal way. Yes. Okay. And um, and then that is that position is at the top right corner of your report. And then the NAD 83 cores 96, and it's an epic 2002 position. It's in the top left corner. Now the concept of the ITRF is an international coordinate system. The North American Datum of 1983 was created in a cooperative agreement between the United States and Canada. And it does a really good job of fitting uh, maps and measurements made by the geodetic agencies of Canada and the United States. It can be used worldwide, but it's commonly not used worldwide. It's commonly used by Canada and the United States. Now, those coordinates, uh, I'm not sure this report, uh, the, the coordinates are accurate, to, it says, to a couple of centimeters, in some case millimeters. Is that true? Is it well, really accurate to that level? When you see those RMS values on that report, you have to remember that's a statistical analysis. And statistics are wonderful, but uh, they're not a measurement of error. They're an estimate of error. 
or you could say is it a guarantee of accuracy no it's an estimate of accuracy. so as a land surveyor uh, what would be your recommendation to get accuracy well there's three ways to guarantee accuracy redundancy <laughs> redundancy Some, redundancy yeah, somehow i knew you were going to say that yeah you just you without a redundant measurement you really you you don't have certainty of the results now i i visited with somebody that he was doing opus reports on his uh, control stations for over a period of six months and he felt like he could position his points to within 10 millimeters i think he's bragging <laughs> but you know when you look at the numbers at some point in time you you make up your mind that you have confidence redundancy yes. uh, okay so finally phil um i noticed that there's even though i have these two latitudes and longitudes and two ecef based coordinate values I only get one set of grid values. I get a set of grid values for UTM and I get a grid value for my state plane coordinate system. Why do I only get one set of grid coordinates and yet I get two of these others? Because this is, and this is a very confusing thing. The National Geodetic Survey computes grid coordinates from the NAD 83 latitude and longitude. And the same thing applies for that orthometric height related to NAVD 88. The geoid model connects the NAD83 ellipsoid height to the NAV80, NAVD88 orthometric height. It's the only connection that we have available to us. So the orthometric height is referenced to the NAD83 ellipsoid height. Nice. The grid coordinates, whether they're UTM coordinates or state plane coordinates, the UTM coordinates and the state plane coordinates are both referenced to the NAD83 latitude and longitude. Great. Well, thank you very much for your information, Phil. I hope that our audience gets something out of this discussion. I do too. It's a very important thing. Yep. Thank you.